Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 588. I am Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. This is Monday the 30th of March, after the fifth Sunday in Lent 2020. Welcome to another program, our Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted. And yes, we're going to talk about that pandemic and the church's response to it. Uh, I don't, normally it's the summer we have nothing to talk about, but I think even this summer we're going to have quite a bit to talk about. Before we get too uh, far into the program, I'm going to do this real quick. Some people have been complaining, Kevin, you're spending much too much time talking about liking the program, sharing the program, doing the comments. And subscribing there that was 15 seconds you can't complain about that i don't want to no more complaints in the comments which you need to comment about how long i take promoting us on social media uh guys uh well, it, kevin there there is an alternative uh, we could start take advertising and i could say lucky strikes are fine tobacco flavor <laughs> right and, uh, <laughs> and we could basically be pitching things we can't do on tv anymore well, let's put up a, the, the current map of the pandemic here. Um, as you guys can see, the world has gone crazy. We're up to 741,000 confirmed uh, cases of um, COVID-19. Uh, most nations have uh, taken a big hit. Uh, even the UK has taken a hit. And two of your leaders have uh, uh, suffered from this. And I thought we could talk about it. Yeah, once again, as the church's response to it. And last time we led off with the Eucharist. You know, Mass and the Eucharist have kind of been canceled because churches are closed. The Vatican canceled everything. Uh, the Lutherans canceled everything. Every major denomination said, fine, whatever. It's not that important. We had a great discussion on it. Now we have uh, people who are allowed to have and I didn't read the article all the way through, but a bishop said to clergy, if you want to have Eucharist at home by yourself, no big deal. Go for it. George, what's that story? Martin Warner, Bishop of Chichester, uh, which is Gavin's old stomping grounds. Uh, he's an Anglo-Catholic. He's one of the society bishops. He released a pastoral letter last Thursday, which we reprinted on Anglican Inc., where he lays out uh, the, the permission uh, temporary suspension of English canon law, which requires three people to be present for an Eucharist to be celebrated. He has suspended that in order for priests to be able to celebrate privately the Eucharist. And they can do this either uh, electronically or I think the, in, in, uh, the, uh, the whole trajectory of the letter is that if a priest wants to do this in the privacy of his own home, he is free to do that. Now, that's a major, major shift. He doesn't go into his, he goes into pastoral reasons why this is appropriate, but he doesn't address the theological reasons, which uh, are quite uh, massively huge. And uh, I, I'm always starting off being the mean one in this show, so I'll let <laughs> Gavin be sweet and loving and kind on this. Gavin, what do you think of Martin Warner? On this issue, on this not, issue. In general, not about George <laughs> Bell, not about any of the other stuff that we all know about Ward, Martin Warner, but on this issue of private, personal <clears throat> Eucharistic sacrifices of the Mass. Ooh, I have to wash my mouth out having said all those words. <laughs> George, your, your, your sense of disquiet about the theology is as nothing as to my disquiet as to Martin Warner. I'm afraid <laughs> I, have trouble, I have trouble loving the man, and, uh, and I won't say why on air. Uh, this is a complicated matter because um, he's probably my least favorite bishop in the Church of England. But on the other hand, uh, so on the one hand, on the other hand, I think what he's done is marvelous. On the other hand, he hasn't described why he's doing it. Um, so, I mean, you're quite right. He hasn't addressed the theology. In the comments last week, uh, I think it was a comments, someone tried helpfully to, to, to explain the difference between the position that you represent and, and that I represent. And I thought they did it much better than I did, actually. Um, and one of the things that they were saying was that in the first 1500 years of the church's life, the Eucharist developed as something that you joined in with in heaven. So there was something going on in heaven 
and and we kind of made a wormhole through time and space and joined it. After 1520, the view changed. It was more 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 the family supper, more a recreation of of of, of a Passover meal um, in the way in which the West understood it. So if you like, one one is more transcendent and one more imminent, one more vertical, one more lateral. Now, here is Martin Warner suggesting a massive change, moving from the horizontal to the vertical axis, moving from let's celebrate a, a love supper, an agape for Jesus, uh, to uh, here is the priest creating his wormhole into heaven and and, and joining in. Now, to, to not say anything sounds a bit sneaky to me. I mean, I completely approve, of course I do, theologically, but I agree it's not, not really adequate simply to pass a rule in your own diocese, allowing some of your more Anglo-Catholic clergy to do what, of course, they truthfully believe in. Um, so I'm, I'm, it, how, on what side does the coin land on the floor? Uh, on the one hand, I'm pleased. On the other hand, I, it's bad. On the other hand, I'm pleased. On the other hand, well, my <laughs> so it's, question, part, it's part of the... Go on, Kevin. Well, my question is, if we can do that, can't we just suspend uh, it being strict to clergy? Can't we have lay presidency? Can't we have lay people doing the, their own Eucharist now? I mean, it's a pastoral thing. This is the time we're responding to a pandemic. Why can't I let learned lay people perform their own Eucharist? Well, I wouldn't be. I mean, the quid, the quid pro quo in Anglican terms would be for the Diocese of Sydney to say, we're going, if Martin Warner can do this in That's Chichester, right. uh, we can do this in Sydney. And then what, what this, so again, you then take, you take one of two views. Um, you either say, isn't the Anglican Church wonderful? Look how, look how pragmatically it responds to the present situation. Or you say, this is not a church with a, with a governing underlying theology that binds people together. Um, if you want that, you become Catholic. If you want pragmatism, you stay Anglican. It depends. Well, okay, we could discuss that. <laughs> My eyebrows I, I are going up and down here. <laughs> yes. I see the semaphore in the eyebrows. So let's, let us say for the moment that, that you know, we have two ways of understanding the Eucharist and two ways of doing this. Uh, and Anglicanism is either the best or the worst of both worlds. You take your pick. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same arguments we've had in the United States for years. Bishops like uh, Tom Shaw of Massachusetts would permit his clergy to celebrate same-sex marriages. It was forbidden by the Book of Common Prayer. It was not permitted, but he basically would suspend the rules in his diocese. And there were no repercussions because the uh, it was a, his response is it's a pastoral response. Now we have Bill Love, who I think were, his trial has been postponed because of the coronavirus, unless they're going, unless the sentence was going to be passed anyway and the trial was just a bit of a fig leaf. Uh, he is being uh, punished for conforming to the Book of Common Prayer and not following the mob in uh, authorizing same sex marriage. It's the same. Uh, now, I'm not equating private celebration of the Eucharist with same sex marriage. No, no, I see that. I, 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 what I'm saying is that if the way, I guess, the way my mind works, the way a traditionalist mind works is let's play by the rules. And we change the rules when we agree to change the rules. We don't just have, uh, by uh, imperial ukase, the, uh, this change that we're going to do. I can't resist no. this. George, this sounds refreshingly Catholic to me. <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> Welcome home. <laughs> well, uh, but, but here's the thing. I mean, we do have guidelines. We do have parameters. We do understand these things. And, you know, they're called the creeds. They're, you know, when I'm, we have the uh, Anglican, Anglican formularies. You may or may not agree with them. And over the course of centuries, we have modified them, changed them. But it has been done in a deliberative hopefully theological way. But just to have a bishop locally say, I am going to do this because I have a group of people who are complaining loudly that they cannot be fully themselves. That's the same mantra that they're going to introduce with living large in love and loot in Luton, whatever this thing that they're doing in England is about permitting same, permitting a local option on same sex marriage. I guess it's, it's, it's I the guess same it's, trajectory. It's the same way of argumentation, and it's I the think, same. It's the same hmm. thing that they they went through as an observer, not as a commentator, but as a observer. It's the same thing they went through with the ordination of women. Well, if if it's fine for us here, you can still be against it until we've gained enough. But 
so the initial arguments are it's only a local thing if you don't like it you don't have to come until now the stories that we see time and again are if you're against the ordination of women don't bother presenting yourself for ordination don't bother presenting yourself for a job in this diocese uh you're not welcome here anymore forget any preference in the church of england even though we have these wonderful rules that say all are welcome all are welcome only if you think the way we do it, it I think I think George one has to make a distinction here between uh, issues of pragmatism and issues of conscience. Um, uh, I, you may be right about Martin Warner using this pragmatically to allow his clergy to do what he knows they want them to do. It's an Anglo-Catholic diocese by and large. Well, at least it is in terms of the mass. It's not in terms of of of, of women's orders. Mar Martin Warner most strangely. Uh, keeps to the Anglo-Catholic tradition in in very many things. Some we approve of, and some we don't. Uh, but he has doesn't seem to have much problem with with promoting. Uh, how do I how do I put this nicely? Um, he do, he he doesn't have much problem supporting the Church of England's move into the feminization of the church's ministry. Uh, but but the the point I wanted to make was. So if it's pragmatism, then that's not a good thing. But it might be a matter of conscience, in which case I think it's an important thing. So, for example, uh, in, in the alternate world where I had I been a diocesan bishop in the Church of England, I'm, I think as a matter of conscience, I would have said to my clergy, you may open your doors. In fact, I would say as your bishop, I believe you should open your doors and I will be at odds with all my fellow bishops and the archbishops, but I'm not at odds with God because there are no reasons I can think of on mm. earth not <clears throat> to, to close the doors of the church so long as all the proper precautions were taken in order to keep people's physical health. But their physical health has to be matched by their spiritual health. And you do not ever close the doors of the church voluntarily. And you do not ever stop offering the sacrifice of the Eucharist. So um, I, if it was a matter of conscience, I'm for it. If it's a matter of convenience, uh, then it's a little bit more shoddy. Is this a message for Justin Walby? I think it is. <laughs> I, I just, I honestly, I, I'm, I'm incandescent. I, I have trouble controlling my myself at the moment. I, I, I don't know whether to, 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 to burst out in anger or to weep. Um, I, I'm so much of the man I am. It was affected by by my Bible smuggling behind. Gosh, I, I'm, I'm feeling quite tearful. Uh, behind the Iron Curtain, where I met the bravest people in Czechoslovakia and Russia who gave their lives and their freedom to worship and the idea that we have archbishops who so are enthralled to health and safety I mean their, 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 their reasons were we must set an example to people not to be unhygienic in, in this pandemic well of course people mustn't be unhygienic you just tell them not to but you don't close down Christ's church to do it how dare they who do they belong to? Who are they representing? Not Jesus. Here comes the anger. I held back the tears. No, that's all right. No, I'm enraged. No, no, I'm speaking enraged. to Pope Francis. Go on. <laughs> you know, no. Um, and, and of course, we know that the um, the Catholic bishops have been slightly uh, less bad, but but only slightly. They have allowed their clergy into the church to celebrate. Uh, I saw a very moving French mass with the French, the wonderful French Archbishop of Paris and some of his clergy. Celebrating about six of them together, keeping two meters between them, um, saying their prayers most authentically, and at least the mass was offered. But how, how can you call yourself a church and, and close these holy places? I, I realize there's also a theological issue, and I've, I've heard lots of people say, trot out the Reformation dogma, uh, which is true, but not the whole truth, that, you know, we are more than buildings, we are a community, church is still going on, it's not about places. But the fact is, it's both and. Of course, the church is about community, but places are holy. We've discussed this in the past. Places are holy. Liturgy is holy. You cannot just jettison them and still call yourself the church. I, I, well, I don't know what to say about the behavior of the Anglican archbishops and bishops. I, I think it is beyond reprehensible. And if they find nobody can be bothered to come back to their buildings, which they don't seem to care about anymore, uh, all their services, which don't seem to matter anymore. All the people are doing is following the example they've set. Um, I'll, I'll be sorry for it, but but bah, bah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here in America, and from what I can see on my Facebook feed, 
the churches aren't closed because I probably saw 1,200 different uh, live streams from the church pulpits around the world where somebody had set up an iPhone or a camera and they recorded the clergy. I saw a live stream from George's church where, and it was quite slickly done, by the way, George, uh, where in essence, the church is alive in its preaching, but what it practices is now, as far as the Eucharist and the sacraments, is DOA. Uh, unless you want to do teleconfession, I hear that's the thing now. Um, you get to call your priest and confess, but you know, I think that the sacramental portion of the church is closed. Yes and no. Uh, George? Uh, well, it's a good Episcopalian answer. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Our diocese, uh, Central Florida, the bishop has all issued no instructions. Uh, we can do whatever we want to do. The governor has, uh, Governor DeSantis has put in an order, of, of Governor of Florida has put in an order asking 65 year olds to stay home. We're not going. We're not on the position of England, where if sixty-five-year-olds, you know, move past their mailbox, they'll be arrested by the police. But I live in one of the oldest counties in the United States. By that, I don't mean it was founded by the Pilgrim Fathers. I mean we have a lot of older people here. The mean age is uh, well up into the high fifties, and so I made the decision with my wardens to cease public worship, and instead moved everything over. Our team of clergy and staff, we're calling people, we're telephoning, we're emailing them, we're in, we're in electronic one-on-one -on -one communication. So the decision was that we need to continue the pastoral outreach. And the hardest thing for me in all this, and it's hard emotionally, it's not hard theologically, which is where Gavin and I sort of part company. We, part, we agree on the conclusion. We don't get there by the same route. Mm -hmm. emotionally, not for me, not celebrating Palm Sunday, not celebrating a Eucharist on Easter Sunday, having the Holy Week is appalling. It's appalling. It's, it's, it's as if my wife has left me. I mean, it's, I, I hate to be that no, I, I agree with dramatic, you. but yeah. a, a yeah. sense of part of my personhood has been taken away from me, yet we are complying with the governor's orders. And I've got to tell friends, I need to apologize to someone. And it's not because I'm always mean to Gavin. I need to apologize to Kevin because I have been taking for granted everything he has done for 10 years. Friends, if you can remember when we started this show, how many, 10 years ago? Something, was, like, that, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, Kevin had more hair and I had more chins. Uh, we would do this with video recordings where we would both simultaneously, Kevin would say start, and we would both push the video camera simultaneously. We would record it, then I, then we would spend, uh, we'd have to do it two or three times. Most weeks we did it two or three times. You did, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, I would knock the camera, so it would basically have uh, the background with me not in it, or we're just figuring out how to do this, but the sound was off. Then it would take an hour, hour and a half to upload it. And then and then that was done for me. And I think, man, that was a good four hours time. And I did not know that Kevin's work only just began. This past Sunday, I did morning prayer from the chapel. And on Saturday, I rehearsed it four times and recorded each rehearsal to make sure the cameras worked and the sound worked and the lighting worked. And each time I had... First time the camera died in the middle. Second time the sound was off. Third time the lighting was terrible because the sun was starting to set. Finally, for the fourth time, then uh, then I had basically a blob of film, and I needed to basically make it intelligible. So I had to go. I said, Kevin, it's four o'clock on a Saturday. What's a good editing software that I can master in the next half hour? <laughs> And Kevin gave me some ideas, and I finally went with the freebie that came with the iMac, and I was able to put in, you know, uh, titles and sort of trim the edges so you don't see me walking on and off camera. And then I put in some opening music. Well, how do I find out what music I can use without the copyright police? You know, and then it's finally done with titles and putting in photos and all this stuff, and I've learned how to master uh, iMovie. 
and now I've got to upload it. And it took like three hours because it's a seven gigabyte file. I finally finished at 5.30 in the morning. And if this wasn't going to work, I was going to have to do the service a fifth time at nine o'clock. Um, so in the past, all I had to do was prepare a sermon. This weekend, that was number like eight on the list. And what was so discouraging was the first time we did it, the first Sunday where the sound didn't work for eight minutes, the production values are crappy. Uh, I had pushing, almost pushing a thousand people that Facebook told me, watch this. This weekend I've got half that number. And then I read what a Facebook view means. It means they looked at it for at least three seconds. How do how does this work, Kevin? How are you? How did how are you successful in doing what you do? Because I haven't, you know, I've just been taking everything you've done for granted over these years. I probably in the last uh, three weeks talked to about eighty different priests about uh, how they can use their iPhones or uh, 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 little Johnny's camera to broadcast their services to Facebook, and it's interesting to the fact that. Yeah, there's best practices. That wasn't my mission. My mission the first week was just to get something on from every church. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. And it, it takes a long time to, to learn the best practice, practices portion. It was so wonderful. It was so wonderful to watch. Last Sunday, I'm going through my Facebook feed. 80, 85% of the video was halfway really good quality. I'm sure the content, the 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 message was wonderful because that's what you guys do really really well but you guys pulled off the video part which is very difficult uh under stress because nobody's used to just talking to a lens so and here's, here's the thing is it i'm talking to people whose opinions i value who are intelligent and two of them are on this screen with me right now I, a morning prayer service at 45 minutes is too long in other words, people will not, mm. you know, a Eucharist for me is an hour and a half. That's, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a morning prayer service at 45 minutes with sermon. People have been trained when they watch video. What is it? 17 minutes? 17, 17 year, year limit. Yeah. And so I'm fighting again. We are, we, the clergy who are trying to learn how to do what Kevin does professionally and makes it look so easy. We are learning that the old ways cannot be easily just reproduced on this new medium. It just doesn't work. Even with the best will in the world, people will flip out because their attention spans are there not are some, geared. There are some interesting insights, though. When I'm doing morning prayer on Facebook Live, there's a little number that tells you how many people are joining in live, and, uh, uh, and they can put on comments. And so it goes 5, 10, 15, 18, 12 and you go oh lord the five dropped out <laughs> what, <laughs> what, uh, what where did they go was it was it w was i not paying attention have i done something wrong and suddenly you have this sense that 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 uh, how how the lord wants people to pay full attention <laughs> during their prayers and there must be in from heaven it must look as though they oh my goodness they're dropping out they're going That's to sleep right. they're, they're not concentrating <laughs> they're not you know they're closing their hearts and the angels are probably uh sharing the kind of concern that suddenly we get to see as the numbers fluctuate in facebook but but um well it's just very interesting to see and a, a different because you'd never know i mean you you know when you're leading liturgy first of all you're not looking at people in that way but you wouldn't you wouldn't know so facebook does tell you how they come and go and it can be exhilarating and depressing. well I, I want to encourage people don't look at the live numbers Okay, if you want to go back after a week and look at how many views you had, that's different. But what yeah. we're, we're finding out is people are, are going to learn. They don't have to watch it live. They're going to get the same morning prayer. They're going to get the same message if they watch it half an hour later or a day later or whatever works in their schedules. Because um, the same families who get up and barely get their four kids to church dressed and with their teeth brushed, aren't doing that this Sunday morning because they can sleep it a little longer and attend the church service. The chaos at home still exists and they don't get online right when you start your 10 a.m. morning prayer. And they're, they're not ashamed to watch it later because they get to. And there's the Joel, for me, there's the Joel Osteen temptation, mm -hmm. uh, which is to play pander. Um, 
I don't pander. Uh, most Episcopal priests pander anyway. Uh, <laughs> and by that, I mean, I take, well, I, I preach about abortion, homosexuality, adultery, all the things. I mean, I, you know, I talk about sin a great deal, and uh, I, I, I stick to the Bible. I don't repeat the New York Times morning editorial. But when you're in this new medium, that the, the, the emotional, the little devil whispering in my ear is, tone it down, be sweeter, you know, don't be, uh, don't be yourself. But one of the first thing that Kevin told me was, be yourself. Be yourself, absolutely. That's what people watch Unscripted for. I want to read a comment, guys. I'm going to go over here. We, we got a really nice comment. Uh, let's see here. It's from Arthur Chumps. He's from South Africa. Gentlemen, another superb show. It's when you disagree deeply that I learn the most. Because each of you explains your position so well, and most importantly, in layman's language. Your respect for each other comes shining through and is a model of how to disagree profoundly and yet remain friends. I learn a lot from uh, the relaxed way in which you discuss very difficult issues with every blessing to each of you from Arthur in South Africa. And oh, nice. we are ourselves. Okay. We talk for maybe half an hour before the shorts, the show starts, we click record. And I have three topics we're going to talk about. We did two of them already. We're going to talk about uh, the third one in just a second as I make the transition. But boy, guys, when you turn that, that recorder on, you're going to be wooden the first couple weeks. Okay? That's just the way it is. Um, my rector was wooden the first time, and I was like, what's, what's, oh, I remember. I, I was like that for the first three years. He, he'll be like that for the first week. It's, it's trying no, to make... No, no. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes and no, Kevin. Yes, yes and no. And no. <laughs> you matter. have you have uh, you have a face for radio. Ha ha. Yeah, ha. I do. Uh, <laughs> but no, you you have uh, you connect mm. with people. That's other people have attempted to do what you have done, and they've failed spectacularly, because you have that. You know, it's why some actors or actresses you just look at when they're on the screen. Others you just sort of pass them by. Yes. It's not their moral worth. But this is a uh, part of a part of the person's talent stack, and you're watchable. You have what they call Q in the television business. All right. Well, that enough about Kevin. I, I do want to make a transition. Uh, I I appreciate what you know. I appreciate the last three weeks because I was called on at a moment of panic for the church to use my skill set. That was wonderful and it's humbling, and I'm glad uh, God trained me up over the last 10 years to be able to, to handle it. I'm going to be doing a live stream today at 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. For those who want to learn more about live streaming, we'll cover some Q&A and talk about how to live stream to more than one platform at once. Ooh, that's been the most requested thing. Do I have to do Facebook? No, you can do 30 different platforms at once. We'll show you how. Um, guys, let's transition because a lot has happened the last month, and it's not just with the church, it's with government. The government has suspended rights that we've uh, earned or been given over the last uh, 15,000 years through sweat and toil by persecu uh, through persecution for the government. Uh, you go back to the Magna Carta, you go back to uh, the, the formation here in America, there are principles that have been given to us as citizens. And a lot of that is our freedom and our freedom of choice and our freedom to worship when we want, our freedom to shop when we want, our freedom to interact and assemble and be political when and where we want. I'm watching slowly as because we are in fear, we're giving up those freedoms. Because we fear a little virus called uh, COVID-19 we're willing to say, okay, yeah, for a time, I don't mind that you close all our churches. For a time, I don't mind that you stop people from New York coming to Rhode Island and pulling them over. For a time, I don't mind uh, Florida putting up roadblocks to anybody coming south. That's okay, because this COVID thing is really scary. Well, I find the government's reaction to this more scary, because I've never seen a government give back what they've taken, ever. George, are you, you're Florida. You're not letting me down there. Yes, Governor DeSantis says uh, 
Now, this is anecdotal. We haven't had an official. I'm sure there's been an official proclamation, but the, the flood of news is so great. Mm -hmm. There are roadblocks set up on I-95, I-70, and I-10. So if you're coming south, those are the three major interstates, one from the west, two from the north. And uh, in Florida, you're still allowed in. Tr trucks are not mm -hmm. stopped, but passenger cars are stopped. If you're floridating your way through, mm -hmm. if you're from out of state, you're basically asked, uh, where are you coming from? If you're from New York or New Orleans, basically the police, the state troopers are saying you need to quarantine yourself once you reach your destination for two weeks. And if you can't really give a good account of yourself, they're empowered to turn you around. It's the same on the Texas-Louisiana border. State trooper, Texas state troopers are turning cars from Louisiana around that don't have uh, essential business because New Orleans is a hotspot, as is New York City. And we're seeing the uh, governor of New York is suing the governor of Rhode Island because the Rhode Island state police are turning around cars from New York. It's, the, not same. Allowed. it's the same in the UK, Gavin. You got, you know, I, I can't get my Easter eggs. Yes. <clears throat> um, this is difficult, isn't it? Because uh, we're in an entirely new situation. Uh, as, as we look back over the 20th century, we've seen a struggle between left and right. Uh, as we look over the last 300 years since the uh, American and French revolutions, we've seen a struggle between individual liberty and the oppressive state. Um, suddenly, the thing is being replayed, but with entirely different rules. Uh, the difficult thing here, for example, is if you say, well, I believe I have a personal right uh to, to to do something the answer immediately comes yes but in a pandemic if you do this you may kill somebody else because you may not be susceptible to this particular virus but you may encounter somebody else who isn't either but they may then pass it on to somebody who is and at one two three four stages removed you will have killed somebody or been responsible for their death now nobody can be blasé about that no one can say my rights are sufficiently important that I'm willing to be careless about somebody else's right to life. The, the problem is, of, but this is complicated by the fact that we have no right to life. <laughs> as, as human beings, we've, re we've received life as a gift from God. Another reason why the churches have to stay open to say thank you to him and to pray for, for his help. Um, but um, a second complication is that the moment you give bureaucrats a certain amount of power, it goes to their heads and they misuse it. I never thought that the people who administrated the final solution in Germany were just German. Uh, you meet them as bureaucrats in every single culture and country. And so our bureaucrats are beginning to take some delight in controlling and spoiling people's lives, losing all sense of proportion. And here's the difficulty. Of course, there are things you should and shouldn't do uh, when it comes to making the place safer. And there's a delicate balance to be had between people getting exercise, uh, doing uh, shopping trips that are or aren't essential, and creating a new climate in society that gets people to voluntarily not infect each other. These are enormously complicated. But George, before we began, talked, if you don't mind my repeating it, George, of, of, of having a sense of fear, um, which he was dealing with. And I, I share that sense of fear. I have a very real apprehension that we're in a completely new ball game, and we don't know how it's going to work out. And the parameters are different. The dynamics are different. The moral, the moral criteria we're dealing with stack up differently. And I share your anxiety that uh, you don't easily get back freedoms the state has taken away from you temporarily. Um, at, at the level of secular freedom, I'm not wholly worried by this. I've seen Christians in my reading of history and in this last century manage a variety of different relationships with the state. But the reason I feel so passionately about churches staying open is that, that in our condition, we have a responsibility to be faithful witnesses to God and to give things up voluntarily when they're not even, not even being taken away from us. The government didn't close the church doors in England. The state, uh, the, 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 the church did. Um, to give them up uh, may mean that they're going to be 
got back with difficulty. So we have policeman Kevin just to finish off saying to, sh to shops, you can't sell chocolate Easter eggs to people. This is not an urgent enterprise. I've never thought chocolate and Easter were particularly associated co closely, but I'm beginning to feel they ought to be now. You've not <laughs> met my mother. She would hide <laughs> chocolate Easter eggs all throughout the house. <laughs> So there we are. We, 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 we're in a difficult time. I share George's apprehension uh, and I have no idea how it's going to, to, to pan out. But I do think we should be very alert indeed to the responsibilities of what it is to be church. One of the things that scares me is the uh, being an evangelical Protestant, one always has a very, one can always count on the total depravity of mankind. Uh, <laughs> and I'm seeing this uh, in various parts of the world where scapegoats are being created for this illness. Mm. Uh, we're seeing this in South Africa where the Archbishop, I've mentioned this before, the Archbishop of Cape Town is basically saying this is not a white man's disease. Once again, it's among the South African population. Uh, this will be devastating because of the high incidence of HIV and tuberculosis and other underlying medical conditions. Don't spurn Europeans, don't spurn our own white population, blaming them for this illness. Um, in my little island of St. Bart's, where I serve the month of November as their interim, as their uh, parish priest, I have had messages from the parish administrator. The island has been closed. The ferries have stopped. The airplanes have stopped. You can only get in, on and off if you have your own private boat. And if you don't get interdicted by the uh, 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 police maritime, I think is the word. And the there are three cases on the island, no deaths. The three cases are Americans and Europeans who have uh, villas. And so the people there tell me anecdotally that uh, the French, who are always sort of a bit brusque anyway with Anglophones, are now basically looking at that as an English disease. And are being not served in shops they're being shunned people are going to find scapegoats for this i think over time traditionally the scapegoats of all in europe have always been the jews uh it's the jews fault it's the white man's fault in south africa it's maybe it's going to be oh those dirty mexicans you know people will i don't mean to be unkind but people will blame others well, I think we had a, a discussion early on, you know, statistically, how is this different than the flu? You know, I think in five years, people are going to say, did we overreact or did we underreact um, based just on the fear of how, you know, this is different than the fear because of how, uh, the flu because of how it affects your body. It fills up your lungs in serious situations where you have to go on a ventilator. The flu doesn't kill you on a ventilator. You know, the flu shuts down your organs and uh, generally affects uh, the older population. This affects healthy, young, old, everybody is susceptible to COVID-19. And that brings in this fear for us. And it also, for me, might be my Americanness, but it, it, I'm fearful of the power of the state. The state seeks to abrogate to itself. Yes, there are emergency measures. And yes, during World War II and during the Great Depression, we had the federal government overreach and it had to be pushed back by the Supreme Court in the 1930s with the National Recovery Act that was ruled unconstitutional and then some of the wartime restrictions on uh, movement, free speech, what you could buy and you couldn't buy had to be pushed back by let's intern the Japanese citizens because they could possibly be an alien source. We're not going to bother with the Germans or Italians because there are too many of them and there are gold Americans, but not the Japanese who are recent immigrants. I'm not confident, as Kevin has says, that the, and Gavin has says, that the government can make good decisions. And I think there is it going to be an attempt to centralize and compartmentalize and take away individual liberties. Uh, in with the fig leaf of disease control, but I, I think it's. Not, I, and we're not there yet. I agree. With, I I think there could well be some civil disorder. I saw some rather rather upsetting scenes in 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 Italy of, of people who had complaining to the police that they had no money and no food, and uh, it was it was very distressing. We're much better off in North Europe, um, but if this goes on for some considerable piece of time, uh, I can imagine that it won't just be the malcontents who. Who are throwing sort of karaoke illegal karaoke parties 
um, which is the latest thing we've had. So we, we don't know. I mean, I guess we, we can be fairly confident that good and bad will come out of it. You know, some of the good that's come out is this new facility for using the internet for the gospel, uh, a sense that we shouldn't have given the Sabbath up so easily. Look how wonderful the Sabbath feels. Uh, a sense that it's really quite easy to give the earth a break. Just don't fly aeroplanes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm personally hate aeroplanes. I hate the pollution they cause. I, I think there's a way that people rush around the earth is stupid. And I'm, I'm particularly grateful that the skies are clear aeroplanes. But um, we will have good and bad coming out of this. And I agree. Uh, those of us who want to preserve space for freedom of worship, freedom of conscience, uh, need to keep a very close eye on what so the state what gives and takes away. Once upon a time in the United States, you could get away from the government. Uh, you could move to Key West if you were gay and not be molested. You could move, if you were a Mormon, you could move out West and not have the state interfere with you. You could move to Alaska. You could move to Florida. You, and though we had national laws, they were enforced uh, differently and interpreted differently. Uh, that's over. The frontier has been closed. And we're now being uh, dictated to by a nanny state that uh, is seeking to guard our welfare and our hygiene and we're seeing this creeping you know authorization well we're actually england is farther along than we are where the state is going into orthodox jewish schools and saying we're going to take away your teaching license because you're not teaching the secular vision of what of human sexuality you're saying homosexuality is wrong and we're having uh, Franklin Graham, whatever his political leanings may be, we're having the Edinburgh and the Aberdeen and all these town councils refusing him permission to teach, teach because he's in, because they call him a homophobe. Well, we we can do I'm better fear, than that. I'm fearful, the, the, the I'm mayor, fearful that this is well, the crux the, that will continue. The mayor of New York City threatened to close down synagogues that aren't closing for this virus. He said, I'll shut you down permanently. Well, who makes that kind of threat? Well, the, the governor of the largest city in America made that threat. I think the biggest change I've seen, obviously, it's wonderful to see the gospel all over Facebook. It's an online and people adjusting to the new times. I've adjusted very well to not hearing a word about climate change, not hearing a word about transgenderism, not hearing a word about all the things that were so important to the press and the government a month ago. I don't hear any of that anymore. They yeah, the trouble, the, uh, Kevin, I think you're, 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 you're absolutely right. That's been a relief for me too, but it throws up a question that's not yet resolved, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so first of all, uh, most of the people in our society were not alert to the amount of totalitarian pressure that George has just described in the culture wars. They didn't care that uh, Christians and Jews were being suppressed by the state in the way that they were. Now, now the state has turned its suppression, its, its its capacity for suppression to civil liberties. They do care, but they're willing to put up with it in the name of of of, hy of hygiene. The thing that has not yet been come clear is what happens to those culture wars when these these uh, restrictions are relaxed. Have they gone away? Are people are, are people shocked into a new sense of gratitude for ordinary living? Or will they simply reappear rather, rather like the infection might reappear the moment you stop the civil distancing? Uh, what's going to happen to that huge pressure? I can't believe it's gone away. It's it's I'm afraid I think it's a temporary halt. So we have two uh, forces of civil constraint uh, working at the moment. One suspended the culture wars and the other implemented in ways we could never dream of the, the pandemic rules. Um, are, are either of them going to improve when this moment of history changes? Uh, I, I have no idea. I'm looking forward to finding out. And uh, my, my fear is that speech is going to be the next casualty that uh, in the name of uh, hygiene, you won't be able to say certain things anymore. We won't uh, be able to Gavin, cough. <laughs> well, G Gavin disagrees uh, very uh, forcefully with the British British government's uh, no, uh, you know, total lockdown. He can still get on this program and say he thinks the Archbishop of Canterbury is a bit of a buffoon, and with which I agree totally. Well, I think that's your words. But well, go, go, go. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> I believe Justin Welby's a buffoon. Uh, 
When is the point going to be reached where Gavin is not allowed to say that? Because it's uh, a hate speech or it's a hate crime. He's going to upset people or he's going to violate new rules and restrictions. And is this, uh, I'm not talking now about the uh, coronavirus itself. I'm talking about the, this is the opportunity to allow the little Nazis, the little dictators, the, the unpleasant fringe in our society who seek to be moralists, but not in the name of Christian virtue, but moralists and secular Marxist moralism, to take away our right to dissent, to take away our right to have the freedom of thought and to speak our minds. Well, that's happened over the last five or six years. People who were offended by speech were allowed to protest and have jurisdictions and police and authorities interfere and say, mm -hmm. that person offended me. I don't want them to be able to speak anti-homosexual rhetoric anymore, anti-pandemic rhetoric anymore, anti-transgender, anti-climate. I mean, the BBC won't have anybody who's anti-climate change uh, on anymore to retort pro-climate change activists because they kept losing the argument. Now, when is the point, Kevin, going to be reached where on YouTube, if you and I or Kevin, Gavin say something that they find offensive according to their corporate standards, mm -hmm. we will, we're not, not monetized right now. I don't yeah. think you see advertising. That's what they're doing right now to people whose views they don't like. But when will the time come when we can't go on that show? Well, I think we're we're still under the radar because we don't say what we say with hate. We just say it in terms of this is what scripture says, this is what science oh, no, says. Kevin, that's, this is that's not why we're under the radar. Um, the, because hate, because you're describing hate the old-fashioned way. Yeah, I, I am. The, 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 well, the, the new definition of hate is to say something that threatens the 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 hege hegemony of the of the cultural imperialists. Sure. So you just so the, 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 I, I'm afraid I think I don't mean to be apocalyptic in this sense, but we live on the very edge of the permissive uh, permission to use YouTube. Um, the, uh, the 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 but, but George is also right. The, when will we lose the capacity to say in public? I think church doors should be open. I think risks can be taken because they're reasonable risks without being deemed to be to be threatening people's lives. Um, I, I'm afraid I think we're on the very edge of, of what's permissible. And the only reason why we haven't been closed down on YouTube is because we're too religious and boring for the <laughs> for, for for the secularists to want to listen to us. Nobody I mean, wants to one, sit down Kev and listen to us for 45 minutes. It's horrible. No, and Ke <laughs> Kevin puts up these wonderful these wonderful uh, titles that are that mask completely what we're really doing. So no Google search is going to trace our sedition. Uh, through the title, okay, you know, long may it continue. Anglican TV has violated Facebook and YouTube community standards since day one. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gary Ashenden. Listen while you can to Anglican Unscripted. This has been episode 588. Thanks be to God. <laughs> <laughs>